So, yeah, I'm back from my travels, shan't be travelling again this term. Um, but I came up with one or two interesting things which I'll pass on to you. Uh, particularly those who are looking at gaming and games and the development of that uh, and the use of games. Uh, some rather interesting stuff that came out of a company in the UK which is doing some really cool stuff. And so I'll put the links up there so that you've got some new resources uh, once I've got sort of settled down. Some very good news for you is that the submission date is not this week as you were expecting, but it's actually next Friday. I've sort of taken pity on you all. <coughs> and, and... And it gives, us, gives me time and you time to see me twice by next, uh, this week on tomorrow and the following Tuesday next week so I can go through with each of you the structure that you've got to, uh, tomorrow and then you can refine the actual words and hitting that page limit uh, for next week. So I'll look at the structure and the ideas this week and I'll then look at what you actually written next week. For as many of you who, are, who actually come in to see me during those sessions in the, in the labs. So, one of the things I want to go, go over, first of all, you know where your assessments folder is in Blackboard? You'll see there the submission point, and you can start using it today to put your current version of your article in there to see what level of similarity it pops out with. Now I've set it up so that it is not going to include your bibliography or list of references in the checking, because that just kind of adds a bit of confusion, particularly the first time you use this. Because it tends to mean that if people have got big bibliographies, most of you, or many of you, are going to be sharing similar sources, and that just causes confusion when you've got Lots and lots of similarity because you've got 20 shared uh, sources which everybody else is using. So I've switched that off for this time. What, what about, what about um, our citations? The citations, they will probably pop up, but hey, you, you can see that that's not a problem. You know, if you end up with lots of citations all nicely coloured, <coughs> well, hey, who cares? Citations is perfectly acceptable. What I'm looking for are significant chunks of text which are shared with other students, i.e. collusion, which is an academic offence, or copied and pasted from one of your sources. And it will find most of them. And as I said before, there is absolutely no value in providing any quotations of any significance in your assignment, in your article for two rather important reasons. One, in the sort of field that we're working in, computing, uh, computer science, informatics, none of the technical authors, none of the uh, business authors on the business website chooses their words <coughs> carefully enough to be worth quoting. With your three page limit, you haven't got the space to put quotations in. Because remember, all of us as academics looking at your assignments for assessing the purpose are not looking at your ability to find sources per se. We are trying to look inside your head. Your article, your assignment, is a window into your brain for us to see what you do with the facts and the information that you find. So even if you have a quotation in there, nice big pithy one, you still got to write all of the words about why it's important, what it means to the development of your argument, how it has consequences. And it's much easier to just put brackets, blog 2014 or 15, are much shorter then putting that huge chunk of text that you so like to fit, put in there. Because your three page limit is very, very tightly constrained. You've got to be really concise. You've got to know exactly 
what your argument is, exactly what your conclusion is before you start. That's why I showed you, if I remember correctly, but I'll show you again, the little picture of the drunken spider's walk. Read like a butterfly, write like a bee. And it's all part of that that helps you to actually get a really concise, <coughs> focused article. Let me just go and find that one for you, if I can. You should be able to find it. Oh, by the way, interesting resources where I'll put, be putting some of these links to interesting websites that I came across at the last two conferences, but particularly the one last week. <coughs> track it down quickly enough. I thought I got it handy. But the point it really is, I've talked to a, couple, a student or two over the last uh, few days, so emails and uh, before I went away and so on, and one of the points is, I've got all this information, I've got covered so much. And I said, yeah, you've got three pages in that um, template format. What you need to do is to yeah, do lots and lots of research. Take your research wherever it leads. Follow the references and citations in what you read. <coughs> Follow up widely. And I don't mind how widely you go. But make notes while you're doing that. Build that working bibliography so you've got all the details because you've got two weeks left now. You've got to get your citations in the right places, and you've got to put all of those references. And they sometimes take a few minutes to sort out. And sometimes those links have just vanished that you thought you had. And you suddenly discover you haven't got a copy, a PDF copy of that source. And you kind of got a link that's sort of halfway, half-baked. Perhaps it's a C drive reference for some bizarre reason, because you're taking the URL out of your browser when you're doing it offline or something. So do all of the research, your note making, <coughs> building that um, bibliography really carefully, of your working bibliography, so you've got all of your sources that you've looked at. Every single one of them properly referenced in your working bibliography to the Harvard standards. And then you start thinking about what that information you've gathered means. You think about it in the context of the broad question that you're trying to answer from those, one of those four topic areas. You think carefully about where do I want to end up? Because it's absolutely crucial that before you actually start writing the actual article itself, you know where you're starting from, what the analysis and the argument is, and what your conclusions are at the end. <coughs> the whole of that should be in your head. What you will find, because this is the first time you've done it probably, is you've got so much in your head. So many things about the bit of the history, the whole history, the timeline, 
You've got the changes, the developments, the impact on society, the impact on the nation, the impact on individuals. You've got the developments which are driving this, and if you're doing the cyber security one or cyber fraud, you've also got all of the work that's being done by the security people to try and prevent it. So you've got the developments from the hackers, the developments of the software and, the, and technologies and so on. And your head's sort of this size. You've got so much information. So now you need to start the planning process. And you can do it in Word or in the mind map or I don't really care what works for you. It could be on separate pages or sheets of a PowerPoint presentation. One page of PowerPoint for each of your sections. Introduction, the history, which probably is a subset subsection of the introduction and then you go in one or two pages for the two one or two sections about the developments the consequences and so on and within each of those you'll probably put two or three or four bullet points which will turn out as your subsections within each section or chapter And then you start looking at now, okay, I've got that, and I've got this bit, and I've got that bit. Now, how do these subsections fit in? Which sequence works best? And you move them around until you're really, really happy that you're telling the story in a way that is going to communicate most effectively that analysis you spent six or eight weeks working on. You see, if we look at the sort of skills that you are required to have to get a good job, yes, they are all your gentlemen and ladies, I'm talking, not you. Okay? You want to go and talk, you can go outside and have a little private discussion outside. You spend a lot of time working on, your, or will be spending three years developing your technical skills, whether in forensics, networks, computer science, IT, the whole gamut, CGP, CGMA. You are spending a lot of time developing technical skills. Fantastic, that's really definitely required. This, employers assume that graduates with a 2-1 or a 1st have the technical skills. But what you need to have if you are going to be successful as employees, as business people, is the whole set of important what they call soft skills. Like technical skills are hard skills. The soft skills are things like curiosity. The thing that you're exercising at the moment, trying to find all those sources that are going to help you to develop your particular take on the subject of it that you've chosen. Curiosity to research, to find out things. As Albert Einstein said, he felt he was not particularly clever, but he was insatiably curious. He wanted to find out how the world worked. He wanted to find out how physics worked. He wanted to find out everything. If he had come here um, and been outside, just outside the atrium there, over the last year, he would have been quite interested at those screens that had gone up around the um, air conditioning just by the side of the south block. He'd have gone over to have a look to see what these plants were that were growing up there and finding it was some form of, um, of ivy. And he would have been interested in why are they using ivy? What's it do? What's it going to look like? And he might have thought about what it looks like growing up trees. Insatiable curiosity is what employers want. <laughs> they want problem identification skills. That's what you're doing as well. You're looking into your field to find something really interesting. There's a problem that needs fixing or, or it has consequences. They want problem solving skills. To be able to take a problem that you've identified and then find some sort of solution. They want communication skills to be, for you to be able to communicate effectively, grab people's attention, 
Hold their attention so that you can then guide them on the story that you wish to tell. That's the structure of your article, is a way of helping to bring them through the story that you're going to tell. They want the idea of storytelling. And if you think that's a crazy thing, because in academia we just need to develop these properly cited and referenced dry articles, don't believe it. While I was out in I, at the IBM Insight conference, <coughs> at the one day uh, session I was at particularly for, I was talking to senior people in business and in IBM, and I was talking about the sort of soft skills we're trying to help you to develop. Yeah, they understood about some of them, but when I mentioned the word storytelling, that was a, wow, you're teaching storytelling? Because one of the things they found is even their own managers, senior or middle or junior managers, and then all the way down through to the techies and the nerds who IBM often employ in places, they feel that they do not have the ability to communicate effectively. They can't put the words together to tell the story in the words that the audience is able to understand. So what you are doing in this first assignment, your first six to eight weeks, ten weeks nearly, is going to be the foundation for you to become exceptional employees. Because so many uh, graduates coming out of universities in Britain and across the world, and I see comments from academics around the world, and that conference in Puerto Rico that I went to, that I chaired, we had people from the USA, from Europe, from China, and all the way around the world. <coughs> and they all are facing the same criticism that most of their graduates don't have, can't develop, or haven't had developed those soft skills. The ability to communicate to their audience. So that's what we're trying to develop here. So structure your ideas with some sort of a mind map, an outline using headers one, two, and three in Word, or separate slides in a PowerPoint. Think about the message that you want to convey. What's the problem? What's the change in technology? What's its impact? How's it had that impact? And what are the consequences into the 21st century? Make sure you know the whole of that story in your head before you start putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard. Think it through, narrow it down so that it will fit with really good analysis in those pages. Those three pages you've got. Write it in ordinary in an ordinary Word document, recognizing it'll be about two pages in an ordinary Word document to fit into three pages in the template. That's from the start of the introduction to the end of your conclusions. Three pages, plus zero lines, minus ten lines. You'll probably find you've not got very much space to put any pictures or graphs or images or anything like that in there, because that just takes up space that you don't really have. Then, when you're happy that it's about the right size, pop it into your template, is that dot, that um, SL, um, Bring a uh, LNCS <coughs> template, see how it fits. And then make sure if you oh, oh, it's too big, well, you're going to have to get a bit more concise, take out a few bits and pieces. <coughs> As an example, this morning I was put, pr producing a uh, proposal for a presentation at a conference next year, early next year, and it said 400 words. And I came up with 415 or so. I had to then go back over it and take out a few words here and a few words there to get to 400 words exactly. 
And similarly for the abstract, 150 words says maximum, and they will check it, or the box will have a problem. And so again, I have to make it a bit more concise. Make the point more clearly. Leave out a little bit here because I can cover that in the presentation later on. Thank you. So, this is how you will become successful. Pla do the analysis, the research, followed by your analysis, maybe and lots of note taking so you don't, you've got it written down in front of you. But make sure you put it into your memory. Just because you know the URL, and so you can find it again, is not helpful at all. Because it means you forget to memorize it, or at least to understand it and put it in here. It is only when it's in here, in your head, in your brain, in your mind, that you're able to balance different ideas together. Because your short-term memory probably lasts technically no more than about 10 seconds, in pragmatic terms about ideas, a few minutes. Which is just long enough for you to understand this bit, remember, uh, have it in your short-term memory, and then go find the next bit by another Google search, and you've now forgotten what you just let, uh, read. So get into the habit of making sure that you have in your head everything about your assignment. All the research, so that you can then weave that story that you are telling to your audience, the pe people who are going to be reading those articles. That's me and Wayne in the first instance. Because you should be able to tell us if we decide we want to have a little viva, and you know, as a practice, you could do uh, you could do this to yourselves amongst yourselves ne uh, early next term. Talk to each other. How much do you remember about the key points of your article? The reason I mention this is because many many times over the last five years or more. I've asked students, well, you know, they're halfway through writing their article. What are the key points that you're trying to develop? And there's a dead blank look. Almost as a, Richard, why are you asking me to do it from my head? I haven't got my document with me. I haven't got my working draft with me. <coughs> why? My response is very much, why don't you know what you're writing about? I still, 10, 11 years later, know the critical points of my master's dissertation. Most of my colleagues do as well. Those who did PhDs know the critical aspects of their PhD thesis, 100,000 words. You should be able to remember, at least two months from now, what's in any assignment you write. Otherwise, that suggests that A, you really don't understand what you wrote about, or at least you no longer understand it. You are not building that progressive understanding of the field of the program that you're working on, forensic, CGMA, CGP, networks, etc., etc. Because what we are providing for you is a slow, well not a slow, pretty fast, layer by layer by layer, climb up some stairs to a deep understanding and the intricate relationships within your field of study. And if you forget everything you learned in semester one of your first year, at the end of that semester, you're kind of starting from scratch again for your second semester, and then your first semester, your second year and so on. It all builds together, up and up and up to greater and greater levels of competence and understanding. Because remember, you come here for an education which is about how you think and work, rather than 
technical training, which is how to program in a specific language. So you're here for an education which is much, much more valuable. Because if you understand how to learn, how to research and learn and communicate, you're kind of set for life. Because you're going to be doing that all your life. Those of you doing um, computer science and you're learning programming languages, when you get out into the big wide world, as I discovered uh, a fortnight ago today, in Las Vegas. One of the co my colleagues there, a senior lecturer professor, was complaining about the speed of change of software packages. He was having to relearn, retrain on his particular package every semester if he was going to stay on top of it. Now that's not sustainable. <coughs> What's going to happen is what you, has to happen is that you need to learn to f where to find all of that guidance material to teach yourself the technicalities, the new syntax, the new grammar, or whatever. And that comes by being educated and knowing how to learn, knowing where to find those technical sources. <coughs> the sort of technical sources that you're taught in Programming 1, in the various professional chat environments or discussion boards, YouTube is a fantastic source of videos of how to do this and that and the other in every possible product you ever need to learn. You will be using those when you go on your placement year. You will be using those once you get your final job after graduation. Many of you who are going into SMEs or small and medium sized companies, there will be no budget for formal training courses at £1,000 a day. Sorry guys, you're not going to get that sort of uh, support mostly. You're going to have to be able to learn how to learn, how to find your sources, your resources, and to use them to teach yourself. We do not necessarily teach you the specifics of any given language, because it changes so fast. <coughs> you will have to learn how to keep up with that. And that was what my, the, this colleague in the States was telling me, telling a group of us, about 30 of us, that it's now almost impossible for academics to keep up to date with every single thing. And that's not what our job is anyway. We're there to help you learn how to learn. That's why I've been giving you so much more about how to structure what you're, you're thinking, your research, <coughs> planning your article. And that's why... Those workshops on Tuesdays are so important for you because it gives you now, for the next two weeks, the opportunity to check your structure with me and then the developing content. Because next week I'll want to see it actually in your template because you may have issues that you want help with. Okay, folks, I'm happy on that one. Now let's move into some other things that are probably quite important. Have we done the communication set? No, we haven't done this one. This is a good one. We will have a quick skirmish through some other aspects about the way that will the ways that will help you to become really, really great students. This is part of the sort of introduction to university <coughs> and Wayne and I feel that it's really important that we help you understand other aspects which we may not have talked to you yet about in the way that universities work. <laughs> some of you who've been to co uh, colleges may have, may have experienced some of what you're getting now. Oh, sorry. Things like presentations, seminars, tutorials. These are the things I want to briefly cover. Again, it comes from Lowe's, Peters and uh, Turner, and it's chapter 6. This is the one I mentioned about studying in the UK. A valuable book, loads of copies in the library, and I think down in um, the bookshop downstairs, they can certainly get it for you. Going back to that soft skill of communication, 
when we run, write an article, write an assignment, give a presentation, just have a chat. What we're trying to do is probably one of two different approaches. One, it may just be we found something really interesting and we want to communicate that information to help other people know where, what, things that they possibly didn't know, to inform people. <coughs> Alternatively, we might be wanting to persuade our audience about something. And if you look at your assignment, you need to work out whether you're trying to inform the reader about the consequences or to persuade them that actually this is really great research that logically comes to this conclusion which is a ah. Partly inform, partly persuade. Sometimes <coughs> there is a, a, an intention really to persuade people that this is what they need to be doing. And so, as part of the planning of that article, once you know whether you're informing or persuading, you need to think of four things. This is kind of orientated in terms of what um, the word, the precise wording around a presentation, but if you change a couple of the words, it also applies very, very directly to your article or to any form of writing. Now, many of you will have done a lot of research already, and you've got a huge amount to say. What you then need to do on that first bullet is think, okay, I, this is what I want to cover, but you then need to focus down on what do I actually need to cover? What do I actually need to say to get my message across? You need to think about the why question. Why do I want to say this? And the answer isn't just to answer the assignment question. You've been given the freedom in this um, assignment to four very, very broad topics where you can choose very, very specifically a small area that really is close to your uh, interests, your excitement, your enthusiasm. So, why do I want to say this? And then you think, why do I need to say it? And that's a filter as you start developing the structure, the topic levels, the section levels, subsections, and so on. Every time you come across add, add something in, why do I need to say it? Or you could ask another question, so what? Does it contribute? Does it help develop the analysis, the argument? <coughs> You also need to think about who the audience is. Yeah, for all of your assignments, yes, it's going to be your tutor or your lecturer who's going to assess it. But think about the current article that you're writing. Is it just for me and Wayne? Or is it something you want to be proud of in the future that you want other people to read, maybe your family, because that will help you feel that it will help them to understand what it is you're going to be doing here at the university for your next three, um, three years or so, four years. And the final question is the how question. How much time or space, how many words, how many pages do I have? Do I need to have all of that time or can I contract it? Maybe all that you want to say will take twice or three times the time or the word count. So use those filters on the right-hand side to reduce it. <coughs> Here are some little exercises that you can take yourself take through. Do these at, uh, in your free time. If you want to discuss them with me tomorrow, feel free to. We can discuss them a little bit further. <coughs> Remember that you have two things. You've got a topic the broad title or the narrow title you develop, but then you need to think about the aim. What do I want to achieve with this article? And one of the ways of sort of 
focusing on the aim is a specific purpose statement. You can write it along the lines of, at the end of my talk, my presentation, my article, the audience or the readers will... Dot, 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 dot. What is it you want to achieve? If you know that, or once you know that, the whole thing becomes a little bit easier. Because it's a, related to the topic and related to your analysis, rather than the aim of, I want to get a first. I want to get a first is a really great aim as a student in your modules, in your program. But it's not the aim of any specific assignment. That's related to the topic and what you wish to achieve in terms of the person reading your article or your assignment, or looking at the little system that you develop, a chunk of code. So you could take an, art, an uh, sort of uh, statement like that. I want a topic along the question of do I trust the internet? And then you can think about what is your specific purpose statement. By the end of my talk, the audience will... What? Am I just going to talk about informing them about why I do or don't trust the internet? Or will I um, have some specific art, uh, on, um, examples which prove my point and persuades them that it's not possible to trust the internet. <laughs> and I came across one last night, um, following up on some uh, music I've been listening to on the flight across from the States, and one of them is a, an old rock band from the 1960s called Jackson Airplane. And if you go to Wikipedia and look it up about why did they choose the name Jetson Airplane, there's about two paragraphs of waffle. Uh, well, not so much waffle, but it's just plain wrong. Because I happened to then track down uh, one of the first people who sang in the band who gave a completely different story. The name Jetson Airplane had nothing to do with uh, things like sort of cigar hold, cigarette holders or whatever, which had a something like Jetson Airplane as a... Sort of acronym. No, it was the name of their dog, Jefferson, which is one I've heard long, long ago, but nothing mentioned in the Wikipedia article. Complete rubbish. You can't trust Wikipedia, as an example. So you could, if you're being a doing a persuasive aim, by the end of my talk, the audience will believe that the internet cannot be trusted. So find a very, very tight, focused aim for your article. Then think about your audience, both Wayne and me, as we assess your article against those criteria, but also think about your friends and family who you might be showing your article to, <coughs> or even a future employer. Because if you were up there in the 80s and 90s, that's worth showing a future employer, particularly for your uh, placement year. Because I've discovered that the criteria we're using are considerably um, worth stretching. They are really, really useful for developing very, very <coughs> good skills. And at the 80, 70, 80, 90 percent, those articles are going to be really good. But you need, so you need to think about your audience, what background knowledge might they have or not have. Remember that most people who are going to be reading these articles are wanting new understanding and new knowledge, new ways of looking at things. It's got to be interesting, guys. You've got to capture their interest. So there might be a little bit of a brief summary. That part of what the introduction to your article is about is to kind of give everybody a common understanding of where you are starting from. Now sometimes if you're doing assignments which are not going to go outside because they're just part of the assessment process rather than to be published, then you make an assumption about the technical levels. You might check it with your uh, lecturer how much background knowledge needs to go in there, and then work from that. So you've got to ask yourself these two questions. And then, 
keep to the time or space or word count constraint that you're given. If you exceed the word count or the time, you're probably chopped off. I mean, if you go to academic conferences, they'll probably give you a 15 minute slot to speak and a five minute slot for questions. And you will get little card five, four, and so on as the countdown, minute by minute countdown. And at the end of five minutes, you stop speaking, even if you've still got another five or 10 or 15 minutes worth of presentation to give. Your assignment, beginning of introduction to the end of con uh, conclusions, three pages, plus no lines. You just got to do it. We have to do it when we submit our um, papers for journals and so on, or present uh, conferences sometimes. 12 pages maximum, anything more than that you pay $100 a page. And most of us don't want to do that. If you're giving a presentation, practice. I've got some fine year students who have a 15 minute plus or minus one minute presentation to give at the end of that for their assessment. Plus one minute, minus one minute. So they've got 14 to 16 minutes and that's it. Stop, type of thing. So, it's all about understanding your audience, understanding your readers, understanding the language that they actually can cope with. It's no good saying, as a politician said a, few, a year or two ago, well, the pop general population didn't understand what I was saying. As though it was their, the general population's problem that he didn't get his ideas across. He should have known that as a politician, words are his stock in trade, that he has to choose words which the audience will both listen to and understand. He should have known that he had failed as a communicator because he didn't choose the right words in the right approach that his audience could then understand. He blamed them. He should have blamed himself. And the same goes, I want you to develop those skills to understand your audience, your readership, of whatever nature, so that you communicate effectively. That's what the problems that business have with many graduates from all of the universities in England. They don't know how, or don't even recognize the need to choose the right language. I don't know if any of you saw many years ago, several years ago, a uh, Microsoft advert on TV. Someone had uh, implemented, a little tiny geeky guy about that high, had implemented an active directory system across the whole company. And he'd met the sponsor, a big business sponsor of the whole project who was tall and beefy and large and full of presence. And the geeky guy who had implemented Active Directory was choosing all sorts of things like, well, we implemented 50 or 100 directories across the whole company, 500,000 account, blah, blah, blah. And the sponsor was getting visibly more and more and more irritated. Because none of this stuff, this technical stuff, was of the remotest interest to him. At the last moment, just before the geeky guy got squashed, doom, he happened to mention, oh, and by the way, by doing this, we saved the company half a million dollars. Ah, now you're talking, my boy. So the message is, choose the language carefully to actually engage and infuse and inspire your readers or your listeners. Because that is what it's all about, communicating and telling your story. And in academic terms, with suitable justification, that is the sources in your citations and in your references. I want you to look at the rest of your seminars and tutorials in your spare time this week, because you've got lots of time to apply to this. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.